All right, guys. I'm feeling a little better tonight. Um, I don't know. <clears throat> I had a cold, and uh, there's nothing, especially with, like, I have a deviated septum. So, you know, to, to like, to, like, basically, like, do videos and be like, oh, look how funny I am when I'm feeling like shit. It's like sticking a cucumber up your ass when you're not high on speed. If you know what I'm talking about. Look at that eyebrow. Ugh. See, um, you know, when, this is going to be a Florida video, so I don't, I don't give a fuck what I do. I can smoke weed on here. I can say whatever the fuck I want. I'm not trying to get these videos monetized. I appreciate you guys. I know I haven't been as active lately. My mom's not doing very well, and then I was sick, and, you know, excuse after excuse. But I am going to do a China video for... VIP, $20 turn up. I'm going to do a parting with celebrity series for sponsors. And then I'm going to start a new series for VIP. And I might trickle down those series down to the $10 tier, but I'll never go below that. I'll never give it to the $3 tier, not because I don't appreciate them, but this is a business and I need to give you guys what you pay for. Um, it is mid month. And I have a lot of footage that coincides with the pimping and pandering series, my breakdown. Well, the breakdown, which we're going to start soon. That's going to be like one more series before my uh, third time in uh, prison story where I go to state and where I'm with PC guys because they're mixing us and that shit was, was fucking crazy. Um, anyway, let's get into the story. So. You don't have to like, comment, subscribe. You don't have to do shit. You don't have to do shit. Just sit back and enjoy that $10 you spent. Smoke what you got to smoke. Take your pants off. Let's all take our pants off. Oh. All right. Now sit on something like a water bottle. Oh. See if... Like, this was going on YouTube. I would have been like, that was so lame. I'm not going to put that on there, but I don't even care. Let's get into the story. So last time I was having sex with a stripper in Southern Florida. Her name was um, Alexis. I'm just making sure that the, uh, the mute button's not on. I can hear it, but okay, let's get into it. So I'm having sex with Alexis in this pool. Um, staff comes up, catches us. And instead of stopping fucking, we just keep going. Now that staff literally gets in the walkie talkie and gets the rest of the staff. So they all are outside. I'm basically sitting there humping this girl in the pool. And they're like, get out of the pool. Get out of the pool. You know, it's, it almost felt like a hostage situation, you know, and they, they didn't even know that my dick was inside of her. It was pretty, I, and this is a completely true story. Um, you know, and then we basically just had to go to, you know, where the stairs are. We had to get out. We were naked. I covered my little root beer barrel dick. She was very embarrassed. She was like beet red. I didn't really care. You know, I was like 19. I didn't have like rat tail butthole hair, like, you know, spewing out of my ass crack yet. I don't have that now because I shave it. I do. Okay, let's go. Moving on. So, needless to say, um, that was not really an embarrassing incident. It was kind of funny seeing all the staff looking at us while we were butt naked. They didn't even know what we were doing. I just had my hands like this, and she had her hands like that. So, I mean, I don't know. You put two and two together, you can kind of tell that what's going on. So, after we get in, <laughs> mind you, there's no, <laughs> there's no um, towels. You know, it's not like this was some authorized youth, use of the pool. So when we get out, we're like shivering and we're like covering our private parts and they don't bring us towels or anything. So we have to put on our old clothes and we're just sopping wet. And I remember walking into the administration building and nobody, like none of the um, patients knew that this had happened. Of course, it was about to spread like wildfire because that's how rehabs are. But, you know, they just see me and her who you know, before that we were not considered any sort of couple or anything. We were just kind of, 
you know, friends, platonic friends. And now they see us soaking wet, like shivering and going into the uh, administration building. So we go in there, the director of the program separates us. I get lectured, you know, program director comes up to me, Mr. Leone, first you leave with Christina after getting oral sex in the bathroom. And I'm like, yeah, well, you know, Christina's a slut. Isn't she here to get better? What, you just expect us to get to rehab and, and already be without problems? <laughs> You've got some nerve. I came here because I have a, I have a, I have a sex addiction. Duh. And he's like, you know, Mr. Leone, you have antisocial behavioral disorder. You're not the first of your kind and you won't be the last. You're the kind of guy that's going to go to prison. That's the second time someone had told me that before I'd actually been to prison. Someone had told me that at um, that program in Utah. This guy was telling me now. And he was telling me that women were going to be my downfall, which is absolutely true. I've been to prison three times, three times inadvertently. It had to do with some woman, you know, Diane Ortiz ratted me out the first time. Second time I was in this completely toxic relationship and it essentially didn't allow me to get sober. Even when I tried to, it was impossible to stay sober with her. I'm not saying it's her fault, but if I was in a healthy relationship, I think I would have had much more of a fighting chance. And then the third time was the pimping and pandering thing. And he was telling me that A, I had antisocial behavioral disorder, and B, that women were going to be my downfall. He said the only appropriate response after, he, I mean, he's like, he's like getting your, getting a, uh, a blow J in the staff bathroom. He said blow J. You know, it's like one of those, I don't know, the guy that says blow J. I mean, just based on him saying that, you know what kind of fucking dude that is. You know what I mean? And so, you know, he, he's like, you know, getting a blow J is one thing, but voyeuristic sex in the swimming pool, unacceptable. Okay. He's like, from now on, you're not allowed to talk to any women at this entire institution. And if you do, you'll be kicked out onto the Florida streets. Now, I'd already been out on the Florida streets. I went out with Christine. She tried to suck dudes' dicks in the fucking uh, gas station. I actually went around the block with one guy. So I already knew it sucked. Florida is horrible. The weather's bipolar. It's humid. There's bugs. There's old people. There's white kids that think they're black. We know the term. It's kind of racist. I'm not going to say it, but it starts with a W. The guys with the gold grills and integrity and respect tattooed on them, and they get the one diamond stud earring, those, those kind of fuckers. So I don't want to be on the street in Florida. And, you know, it was true. I did have sexual compulsion issues. Um, always have. Always will. <laughs> you know, um, now I'm 34. I'm in a relationship. I've been with Karina three years. Uh, in a couple weeks, on May 5th. Cinco de Mayo, three years from the day that I fucked her in Walter Claudia's swivel chair. And we fuck every day, every single day. I wish I could be like, hey, Karina, do we fuck every day? But Nico's sleeping. And we were just talking about it the other day. And she's like, you know what? It's not normal. I was like, what do you mean it's not normal? And she's like, I think there's something wrong with us. I was like, no way. Sorry, it's not. Um, so, you know, even though I'm in a healthy relationship now, we, we have sex every day. That's, I don't know. I don't know what other people's sexual habits are. I don't ask people, you know, I don't call people and be like, hey, bro, how many times you fuck your wife? People, I'd lose friends if I said shit like that. That's not really something you talk about. And I don't, you know, I don't know. I just feel like I can talk to you guys because I trust you more than the YouTube people. And we have sex every day. So I feel like I'm not well adjusted, even in a healthy relationship. I'm not in like, you're probably like, well, that's not a bad thing, but it's weird. You know, like we can be mad at each other and we'll still fuck. It might be anal, but we're still fucking. Totally pointless rant. So check this out. So the rest of the time that I'm at this place, I'm not allowed to talk to women. And it was hard for me. And once in a while I get caught talking to one and, they were 
you know, pretty much kept threatening to kick me out on the street. And I kept talking to my parents and the family therapy sessions. And my dad would reiterate that, that, you know, if I did get kicked out of this place, he wasn't going to help me. I was just going to be homeless. And I'd already been homeless in Santa Barbara, a town that I'm from. The weather there's nice. I know people. Nothing too bad ever happens there. This is Florida. Totally different. I'm out of my element. So I don't want to be homeless. So I stayed in my lane. I end up staying in this rehab for probably, I want to say maybe eight weeks, going to classes. Um, you know, I was still the class clown, you know, and, you know, telling people I was a pro skater. And a couple of people called me out. You're not a fucking pro skater. They're like, yeah, I am. Yes, I am. There's no way to prove it because there's no skateboard here. <laughs> and then one day, one of the staff, you know, one of the staff had gone home and, you know, she's some blonde girl. She's probably like 27. And I guess she told her son, Hey, um, I'm with the pro skater. And he's like, really? What's his name? And she's like, Ryan. And at the time, Ryan Sheckler's reality show, who's a pro skater was on MTV. So he probably thought that that's who I was. And he's like, wow, mommy, I do know who that is. He's really famous. So she like totally, you know, drank the Kool-Aid. And so one day she brought a skateboard to work. And they called a special meeting outside. And they're like, okay, everyone, we have a treat. Ryan's going to skateboard for us. Now, I'm not bad at skateboarding, but I can't pull off being a professional skateboarder. That's for fucking sure. And, you know, like I went and I, I tried a couple kickflips and was like having trouble landing them because... You know, I wasn't skating every day. I think I landed one like really shittily and everybody is just kind of look, it was so awkward. You know, there's probably 80 people just watching me skateboard. You know, everybody's in these chairs around this concrete area trying to watch me do flat ground tricks and I can't really pull it off. And, uh, it was a pretty embarrassing moment for me. Um, that was in the middle of that eight week period. And honestly, after that, I was kind of ridiculed at this place because people knew that I was full of shit. So, you know, everyone would be like, what's up, Leone? You going to do any nolly trays today? And they'd like give each other five. It was like some eighties fucking teenage rom-com or something. I was just like, Jesus Christ, this sucks. And I wasn't allowed to talk to girls on top of that, you know? So basically the only option I had was to get into recovery because it was popular to be into it, you know, and I'd like stand up and I'd give these like Martin Luther King-esque speeches, you know, and be like, I want to be clean. One day I will because I want to be better. And everyone would just be like, really feeling that, Leone, really feeling that. And that's how I got through. So I get, I get out of this place. Now, I'm under the false assumption that when I get out of rehab, my parents are going to let me come back to Santa Barbara. Now, remember, I have a warrant for my arrest. But by the time I had put eight weeks into this program, I was homesick. I was only like 19. I wanted to go home. So... When I was done, my dad said, no, I want you to live at a sober living for another 90 days out there. I want you to get a job. I want you to get a sponsor, work the steps. I want you to prove that you can have a balanced, structured lifestyle. Then I'll let you come home. <sighs> okay. All right. I'll do what I got to do. So I end up moving into the sober living. It was called the mustard seed. Mustard seed. And it's probably like just a little house in West Palm Beach, Florida, maybe three bedroom. And there's probably about nine guys living there. It's a good group of guys. We barbecued every day and, you know, they would take us to meetings and vans if we didn't have our own vehicle. Most of the people there were from Florida. It was like the one that was from California. So everyone called me Cali. Like, what up, Cali? Well, can you not call me that? Nobody in California says Cali. What up, Kelly? All right, all right. And I end up getting a job as a telemarketer for a diamond bilge rate, uh, diamond uh, 
drill bit company, basically cold calling, you know, construction companies and trying to sell these diamond drill bits. And I was pretty good at it and I was making money. The job was in Miami. I had to take the subway there, probably took an hour each way. I think it was like three or four, probably about three and a half hours of commuting, you know, uh, all together. So I'd wake up, I'd go to work. And then when I came home, we'd hit an AA meeting, we'd barbecue, go to sleep, you know, and sometimes they had chores there. Um, and, oh, I forgot to say, you know, before that I had gotten a job as a dishwasher, you know, and I, listen, I've never done any manual fucking labor in my life. Being a dishwasher was like hardcore for me. So I, you know, I went to this spot run by some Puerto Rican dude and he's like, no, 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 no. Like this, like this white boy. He called me white boy. Like this, you fucking stinking white boy. Like, let me show you. Let me show you how to scrub. Scrub like this with a toothbrush. Like a toothbrush because you look, you, you scrub plates like a fucking pervert. I was like, oh my God, are you kidding me? And the, the, the worst part about it is this was like a trendy restaurant. And like the waitresses were fire. And then there's me with my little apron my fear and loathing in Las Vegas tattoo. I'd always, of course, have one like sleeve rolled up so that I could like show off my ink, be scrubbing the, the dishes, even though I weighed 130 pounds. I don't know. And I lasted there one day at the end of it, after working like six hours of like, just, I, I seriously felt like I was like on American gladiator or something. Like I was like just drenched in sweat. There was like um, cake, uh, soap caked in my eyes. So they were like slanted and red. I was like puking because I was so fatigued and just like, just like wiping the puke off with like the back of my hand. Just like, fuck it. I'm just going to keep washing these dishes. It was really hard for me. And after all that, he's like, okay, now you fucking clean the entire kitchen. You do that white boy. I don't want nobody else to do this shit, but you. With the fucking toothbrush. Like, well, can I use like a mop or something? No, the fucking toothbrush. All right. And so I didn't. I just went back to my sober living. And there was a, you know, a, a voicemail the next morning. It was like, you fucking little rat. You don't clean no fucking kitchen. You're fired. Don't even bother coming back here, you little fucking faggot. And I'm just like, beep. And, uh, you know, everyone that lived at the house thought that it was super funny. And they'd always, they'd, you know, they'd always like imitate him, you know. Be like, hey, Ryan, can you do your chore? You little fucking faggot. And it kind of became like an inside joke. So then I got this job working at the sober living place. I'd go there, I'd come back, I'd start doing, you know, I'd go to an AA meeting and I found this guy named Jemiah. He was like this little, kind of looked like Jonah Hill, chubby guy, glasses. He's like, hey, or, uh, Jeremiah. Hey, I'm Jeremiah. Yeah, it was Jeremiah was his name. I'm Jeremiah. I've been sober for six years. I'm like, really? You look so young. Yeah, I'm 23. Like, you've been sober since you were uh, 17? He's like, yeah, I got sober in high school. Found the program. Never looked back, homeboy. Huh, <laughs> I was going to do the voice. Um, and so I was like, oh, cool. Will you sponsor me? He's like, oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I'll take you to Tom Petty concerts. I like soft jazz. I don't give a fuck. We'll make it fun. We will make this shit fun. I was like, all right, cool. And so, like, I went back to the sober living. I was like, guys, I got a sponsor. And they're like, really? Who? Because, you know, it's like a closed, tight-knit community. I'm like, Jeremiah. And everyone just started laughing. They're like, dude, that's like the most predatory gay dude in the entire fucking AA circuit. He says he's bisexual. Watch. He's going to try to 13th step you, which means that, hey, come over and do step work. All right. So this is the third step. This is the fourth step. Hey, can I suck your dick? Well, okay. I'm sober. Fuck it. Let's do this. I mean, that's what he's hoping for. I never, I never fell for it. But I was like, oh, great, dude. I'm trying hard. I got this Jeremiah dude. This, and you know, what am I? And I'm, I've never been a good, 
never good at like firing people or breaking up with someone or firing a sponsor. I'm just not, I'm, I, I feel bad about it, you know? And uh, so I kind of just, you know, I stuck with him, you know, and he'd call me be like, Hey man, um, oh yeah, I got a new decal on my Honda. <sighs> I was thinking maybe we could wash it together. Wash the decal. <sighs> it's on my car. It's a Honda. I was like, nah, dude, I got I got somewhere to be. Now, this whole time, I'm celibate, right? Under his direction. I mean, I should have been able to read the subtext. He'd be like, now listen, Ryan, no girls. They're going to want to have sex with you because you're so handsome. And of course, I'm narcissistic. So I'd be like, really? How handsome am I? Oh, you're a 10. Really? What do you think is my best feature? <laughs> I don't know. I've only seen you with your shirt on. I'd be like, you know what? This is getting a little too hot for standard sponsor sponsor relationship. I say we take our clothes. No, I'm just kidding. But, uh, you know, so there was like weird. It was, it was awkward. It was fucking awkward because he was overtly gay. He overtly wanted my dick in his mouth. And he's like the only real sponsor I ever had. But regardless, I'm going, you know, uh, to this diamond drill bit place and coming back, going to the meetings and now talking to Jeremiah on the phone, you know, and, uh, you know, it was weird. You know, I call him, he'd be like, what are you doing? I'd be like, nothing, nothing. <laughs> What are you wearing right now? Why the fuck does that matter? I am just wondering. So it was, you know, it was an odd time. And around that time, my parents had been asking to get me into, um, psych uh, to start seeing a psychiatrist. Now I've always been against psychiatry. I'm like, no, 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 no. I don't want to be on psych meds. Psych meds always make me weird. They make me impotent or they make me have like more acne than I already had or, I guess basically impotent was just the bad one. I had a couple situations where I couldn't get it up. Um, I, and that's, it's rough when you're like 18, 19 and you're just kind of developing and you're getting your sexual confidence and you finally pick up a hot chick and choo. And you underperform. You can't even get it up or you premature ejaculate. I mean, you know, everyone's been through all this. Um, and uh, so that's really why I didn't want it. Even though I wasn't having sex, I just didn't want to be on anything that could possibly make me not be able to have a boner because I kill myself. And, you know, uh, eventually my dad had talked me into it. So I got on some SSRIs. I think, I don't even remember. I've been on so many different psych meds. Got on something, something psychotropic and um, started taking them. I think, I, I don't I don't even remember, but I started feeling better, you know? And it was probably the most well-rounded I'd ever been in my life. I got up to 66 days. And on my 66th, 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 Jesus, why can't I say that? Let's just say it was 65th. Fuck it, we'll lie. On my, no, on my 66th day being sober, I went to a meeting and it was a late night. It was a candlelight meeting. You know, Jeremiah's there. He's like rubbing my shoulders. He's like, does this feel bomb? I was like, Avi. I was becoming like some like gay AA guy. Um, but, you know, it was nice because I just got my 60-day chip a few days before that. And, uh, you know, I would really started establishing myself in the AA community in Florida. Um, I was talking to some girls flirtatiously, talking on the phone. It was comparable to junior high. You know, in AA, they have like dances and, um, you know, fun kind of innocent stuff. And I was already kind of forging relationships with multiple women, platonic, but flirtatious nonetheless. And I was happy. And my parents were so fucking proud of me. You know, 66 days is a big deal for me. 66 minutes is a big deal for me. Um, but that was the first time I'd ever gotten voluntary clean time like that. And um, 
on the 66th, <laughs> Jesus Christ, on the 66th day, I went to that candlelight meeting and I went, I went back to the sober living and it was probably about midnight. Now the curfew is usually 10. On the weekends, um, you could get a pass or you could get the curfew extended if you're going to a meeting. So I came home at midnight and the house manager was there. Don't even remember what his name was. Don't even remember what he looked like. But he's like, hey, Ryan, uh, we got to drug test you. I said, okay. You know, with confidence, I was like, sure. He gives me the cup. I go to the bathroom. I pee. This is before probation or parole. Um, well, I was already on probation back in Santa Barbara. But anyway, I didn't have to show my dick. I pee. <clears throat> I give it to him. And, you know, it's instant results. He peels back the label. And he's just like, oh, my God. You're dirty. I like the fuck out of here. He's like, no, 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 I'm serious. You're dirty for benzodiazepines. Benzodiazepines. Why can't I fucking talk? But benzos. I was dirty for benzos. And uh, I was like, dude, I have not taken benzos. He's like, Ryan, these tests don't lie. I said, of course they do. There's false positives. I didn't take any benzos. I'm on psychotropics. I'm on antidepressants. You know I am. I'm not on benzos. Perhaps something triggered it. It's a false positive. Send it to the lab. He goes, Ryan, you've been lying to us the whole time, and you're a liability to your brothers here. I'm like, are you serious, dude? You're not going to give me the benefit? Look how good I'm doing. I'm getting up. I go to work. I have a bisexual sponsor that I have to evade butt fucking every fucking night. I don't want to do that. I don't want to go do step work in his bathtub. You seriously think I'm on benzos? He's like, I do. I think you're a piece of shit too for lying to us. You know, he's a real like dirty Southern Florida guy. I think you're a piece of shit for lying to us. That's what I think. Now, the other guys at, that, at the sober living come up and they're just like, it's not cool, Ryan. It's not cool. You guys don't believe me either? Honestly, Ryan, no. You're an addict. And this is what addicts do. I, I, stop with that shit. Stop right now. I'm telling you, bro. If I ever lied to you, have I ever lied to you? Well, they're like, you did tell us that you went to high school with Katy Perry. I was like, I did. She's from Santa Barbara. Her name's Kate Hudson. She's my age. I didn't even go to high school with her. I, I, she was in Karina's class, but, you know, I knew her growing up. I basically did go to high school because all the high schools partied together. So I saw her frequently. She was a, a Christian girl. Like you said that. You said that um, you went to boarding school across the street from Michael Jackson's ranch classic pathological lies that's true too what do you mean point is ryan is you've lied to us a number of times get out i was like are you fucking kidding all right you know what where am i supposed to go dude it's midnight i'm in west palm i don't know anybody around here dude what am i supposed to do well um We'll give you your cash deposit back. You give me my cash? Okay. All right. I pack my shit. I have like one duffel bag. Everybody's just scowling me. <sighs> How could you? Just like whatever. Take my duffel bag, $300. Of course, in my mind, I'm like, this is just, this is crazy. I'm gonna, I'm, they're saying that I'm on benzos. I'm going to go smoke crack. Fuck this. I called my dad and, uh, you know, I was like, dad. I got, I got kicked out of, of mustard seed. What? And I was like, I got a false positive for benzos. He's like, what are benzos? I'm like, Xanax, Ativan, Clonopin, stuff. He's like, Ryan, how could you do this? Your mother and I were so proud. I'm like, you too, huh? All right, well, I have $300. He's like, where did you get that? Did you rob a bank? Um, did I, did I, have I ever done anything like that before? Fuck you, dude. Hang up on him. So I end up going to the bus station. It's like mid, it's probably like one now, probably like one in the morning. 
West Palm Beach is not that ghetto, but it's not that nice either. And at the bus stop, I see this guy that I saw every single, I rode the bus with this guy to the subway every single day. He was living in a sober living in the same area, you know, and we'd gotten to know each other. He was a heroin addict, just like me, but he was sober. We were both on a sober trip. We were both taking the bus to work. Um, We were taking the bus to the subway because he was working in Miami as well. And he was sober. I saw him and he's just sitting on the bus stop like one in the morning. I'm like, Hey, what's up? He looks at me. He's like, huh? Well, I'm just going to take a guess and say that you're probably doing the same shit that I'm doing right now. Let me guess you relapsed, huh? I was like, well, actually, no, I got a false positive for benzos. And he's like, Ryan, are you expecting man? Shut the fuck up. Not you too, bro. I said, what's up? What'd you relapse on? You got any heroin? And he's like, he's like, yeah, right, dude. He's like, there's no heroin around here. It's like the only thing we can get is crack. I'm like, where? I look around. You can like hear crickets chirping, like the middle of the night, just some humid ass night in Florida. I'm like, what is crack just going to magically appear? swear to god i say that and some black kid he's like 16 just like on some like mongoose bmx bike just like going down the street listening to his headphones and you know this guy like waves him down this this guy that i was taking the bus with waves him down guy comes up and brian's like how much money do you have i'm like give me a 100 bucks for it he's like okay gives it to the kid kid just spits out some crack keeps going i'm like that's random he's like i don't know that kid loops around this area He's like, but there's no heroin here. So it's funny because I said I was going to go smoke crack, and that's exactly what I did. Him and I already had a crack pipe. We end up going to a dugout, you know, like where Little League plays baseball, smoke crack, and we end up passing out there. You know, I remember the come down that night was excruciating. I was just sitting there like, God, everybody thinks I'm a junkie. But now I fucking, now I did relapse just through 66 days, you know, down the drain. And it sucked because I had really given that stretch of sobriety my all. I mean, I was 19 and that was one of many, 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 many efforts that I fucked up. But, you know, that's how I relapsed in Florida initially. Um, And, you know, the next day we end up, um, you know, going, we like, we end up taking a bus, I think to Miami, you know, the same kind of route that we would take when we go to work, we take a bus, get a subway, uh, get on Okeechobee. I think that's what it's called in Florida. And we go to Miami and, uh, you know, we're in a bad area and we just go, I have like my duffel bag with me and we go into this bad area and we end up finding some heroin and we're just kind of hanging out on the street doing heroin and chipping away at the $200 that I had left. Uh, I don't think he had any money. I think I was just like kind of supplying his habit just because that's how I am. You know, I back then that's how I was. Nowadays, if I relapse, I'm on some solo shit because I'm such a dope fiend. But back then, you know, it was worth it to split drugs with someone so I wouldn't be alone. Made it like a little less dangerous to be, you know, uh, navigating the labyrinth of the ghettos in Miami, et cetera. And so we're doing heroin out there and it was coming in these little pill capsules, these little teeny pill capsules. And you got one of those for, for 10 bucks and it was shitty. It was like brown powder heroin, some of the worst heroin I've ever done. It would take you like two or three of these capsules just to get off without a habit. And we end up running into this gay guy that's our age. Well, so this guy, I forget what his name is. I think his name was Brian. We'll just call him that. Um, the guy that I had smoke crack in the dugout with. And Brian uh, was like 40. No, I was 19. So my like perception of how old he was is off. He was probably like 30, <laughs> you know? Um, I was just thinking like 10 years older than me. I'm like 34 now. So he's probably about 30. This gay guy was probably like 22. So I was the youngest out of it. And this gay white guy ran into us in the ghetto. 
and he, he he had just had the most vacant eyes he's just like so sad right and he runs into us he's like can you guys get heroin I remember Brian being like, Jesus, do you need heroin, dude? And I was like, huh. sure looks like he does, Brian. He's like, oh, no. So we end up getting him heroin. And now this gay guy has a shitload of money. And I guess what had happened is his boyfriend had just committed suicide in their apartment together. You know, they were not on drugs, but I guess his boyfriend used to be and had relapsed. And this gay guy didn't even do heroin, but, uh, you know, his boyfriend had like, I guess, hanged himself at their apartment. So now he just decided it because he was strung out. And I guess this other, his boyfriend, the other guy had found out that his boyfriend was strung out. They got into a big old fight about it. And somehow the dude hanged himself. And now the other guy who was in the ghettos looking for heroin, even though he had never done it. And he had a shitload of money. So, classic heroin addict move. We're like, oh yeah, we can get you heroin. Come on, <laughs> come here. We're not like the others, man. You can trust us. I threw some fear and loathing in there. And uh, so now we make this guy pretty much pay for everything. He's paying for everything. And he'll just like come to, he'll get, his a, ho- he'll get a hotel room and two beds. I slept in the same side with uh, Brian, and then the gay guy had his own bed, swear to God. And he would snort this powder heroin, and he would just nod out. And like Brian would be like, hey, can we get 10 bucks for cigarettes? He'd just be like, he'd like go in his pocket and just give it to us. You know, he was just starting heroin, and he would puke and, you know, whatever. So that went on for, I don't know, a couple weeks. I'm not in contact with my parents. and. Um, what ends up happening is Brian leaves one day. No idea what, to this day, no idea what happened. We just disappeared. I mean, that's how the drug world is. People just come and go in your life, hang out with them tough for a couple weeks, two, three weeks, go through some crazy shit with them and then never see them again. It happens all the time. I've I've literally probably have hung out with a hundred people like that throughout my life as a drug addict. And so he kind of just left us and now it's just me and the gay guy. And this guy is just getting more and more and more depressed listening to like the most emo ass shit and like just like sitting there with the bath water running not taking a bath just laying on the bathroom floor like listening to music he had like one of those old like ghetto blaster boom boxes and he'd just be listening to this i don't even i think it was like moby yeah it was like that kind of shit and he would just be like uh, and, like i'd be like dude Take a shower, bro. It's been like, you you smell like shit, bro. You're like, oh, I just, oh, I'm in so much pain. And I'm like, all right, well, let's see what's on TV. Oh, Die Hard with a Vengeance. Die Hard with a Vengeance is on TNT. What's up? Come watch it. I don't want to live. All right. So then, a few days after... Brian had left. It was just so, it was getting so depressing in this hotel room. One night, go to sleep, wake up the next day. He's gone. No note, no nothing. So I'm like, hmm, he'll probably come back. I'm just kicking on the bed watching TV. You know, the phone rings. They're trying to kick me out of the motel. I'm like, well, yeah. Um, the dude that's paying for the room's not here, but he'll be back. Well, sir, you must be out within the next 30 minutes. You know how it goes in a motel. I've become so good at prolonging the process. I, you know, I'll say just, I'll just keep giving them excuse after excuse. But eventually, like, you know, like the whole mob of them shows up to the door. Hey, you guys need to get out of here. You need to get out of here. So I got kicked out on the street. Now, all I have is my duffel bag, humid, Florida, nowhere to go. I end up making my way to Delray Beach, which is like a nice touristy part of Florida. Now, once again, I'm strung out. I have no money. I have no way of getting more drugs. I don't even know where to get them. I have no shelter. I have nothing. I'm fucked. I don't even know 
my way around Delray Beach. So I kind of make my way down to the beach and I find like under this particular pier, there's kind of like a couple homeless guys, but they are like the kind that talk to themselves. So like I tried to be diplomatic with them and they'll just be like, you know, they'll just say some random shit about Vietnam or something. And I'm just like, oh man, I already know how this summer is going to go. So I just kind of started figuring out how to survive by myself on the street out there. And my mom would Western Union me money here and there. Um, You know, if my dad didn't, my dad would always cock block it. If he found out about it, he wouldn't let her send money. And, um, you know, I had to kick heroin in the beginning there at Delray Beach. Then I started getting, you know, I started hanging out with like homeless crackheads and I was smoking crack, but I didn't really have... Um, it was hard to sustain a heroin habit, even though I found places where I could get it. <clears throat> I was mostly doing crack now. I, I had to kick the, that first little, it wasn't that big of a habit. I was strung out for like maybe two weeks, still had a kick and it sucked, but now I was like doing mostly crack and heroin when I could afford it. And what I would do is I would sleep on the beach. The problem with sleeping on the beach in Florida, it's not like Santa Barbara or California for that matter. It'll be perfect clear skies. 30 minutes later, clouds form, starts raining, and then it'll clear up 30 minutes after that. Completely bipolar weather. So it'd be the middle of the night. I just, and I didn't have a sleeping bag. All I did had was my duffel bag. So I'd use part of it as a pillow. um, And I didn't have a blanket or anything. I just kind of like lay on my duffel bag. A lot of times I would panhandle for money. And even though I didn't become like a big alcoholic until much later in my life, I started drinking alcoholically at, for a little bit during that period just to sleep. You know, I would just get bottles of Southern Comfort, um, probably cheaper than that, actually. I don't even remember. Some sort of whiskey. And um, i just drink it so that I'd be warm at night and so that I'd pass out. It was the only way I could go to sleep. Pretty shitty lifestyle. And, you know, to feed myself, I'd panhandle, go to Jack in the Box or go to McDonald's and get dollar menu items. It was pretty whack. Um, I got laid a couple times. Sometimes I wandered like to hotels. I like didn't have like, I couldn't shave or anything. So I just looked like I had this like really like, um, you know, I mean, I know that's like fashionable sometimes when you have scruff, but like I smelled like shit too. So like it works if you don't stink. But if you have scruff and you stink, it's a red flag for being homeless, you know? And once in a while I'd find a girl that was like tipsy enough where I'd be like, Hey, I'm Brad. Hi, Brad. I'm Ashley. Let's go. Fuck. Go into her room. The next day she would be like, um, did we, I'm wearing like some bathrobe with like embroidered fucking, you know, letters of the hotel on it. Sitting there like, drinking like orange juice without alcohol out of a fucking champagne flute i was like well well darling (laughs) you were rather inebriated last night but no i was a gentleman about it but look at this chocolate that you have it's absolutely to die for she'd be like yeah who the fuck are you get out of my room so that kind of shit would happen once while i get lucky bucket chick she'd take me back to her hotel I'd, ha- I'd get like a night's sleep that was like when I was lucky other times it was just straight up panhandling or bait and calling my mom mom I need money I'm so hungry Ryan if I send you money you're gonna spend it on heroin no I won't she sent me 50 bucks I go spend it on heroin and it was just a fucking really shitty time in my life so what ends up happening is one night I'm starving Like, I'm starving and I don't have any money. Go to a gas station, I'm panhandling, and, you know, a cop rolls up. What are you doing? Tries to run my ID. I didn't have an ID on me. I remember I have a warrant in another state. I don't know if that's going to come up or not. This cop pretty much comes up and harasses me. Now, this is the only gas station within, within walking distance of where I'm staying at the beach, and it's the spot where I panhandle. This cop is like, listen. I'm new to this area to patrol it. And 
I'm not with the panhandling shit. If I see you here again, I'm going to arrest you for um, loitering. I was like, oh, that's pretty bomb. Okay, cool. So, you know, I'm starving, no money. Um, I end up calling my mom, you know, use somebody's cell phone, (laughs) which when you smell like shit and you're scruffy, you know, you look like a straight up some sort of like the, you ever look at like the sex offender registry and you see the guy with like the scruff and he's like, that's me. That's what I look like. Look like straight up weirdo. And, uh, you know, getting someone to let me use their phone, that, just, that in itself was always a challenge. But finally, I get a hold of my mom and I'm like, Mom, I can't. I'm so hungry. Western Union, me 10 bucks, please. And she's like, All right, I'll send you some money. But it was too late to receive Western Union. So I had to wait until the next day. So by the time I was able to get the money, I get 50 bucks. She sends it to me. I spend it on heroin, pack of cigarettes, and some food. I am starving by the time I get this money. And, uh, you know, I get high, I eat, and I go to the liquor store, and I still have some money. I have like 11 bucks left, whatever it was. I buy a pack of smokes, and I buy a scratcher lotto ticket, and I buy a lighter. I leave, start smoking a cigarette, walk back to the beach spot. Now, Clouds are really dark, almost like a charcoal gray. And uh, I know that like a big storm's coming and Florida is known for having crazy ass storms. And I'm just looking up and I'm just like, huh. So this is what kind of night I have to look forward to. So, you know, that day it rains hardcore. I don't have a hoodie I don't have, because when I was at rehab, I was giving away my shorties hoodies to uh, girls because they'd be like, yeah, I'm a pro skater. Here's a free hoodie. Let's have sex later. All right, cool. No, I didn't have any. But I didn't have really anything except for t-shirts and it's raining. I'm soaking wet. I'm miserable. I think I even jerked off a couple times on the beach. They're probably like tourists and shit. I was like, I don't even care. I'm homeless. I mean, just get it. And finally... The sun goes down and it rained, it rained all day. I remember this <laughs> like it was yesterday. And I'm sitting there smoking and I can't even smoke a cigarette because every time like I'll take a few drags, the rain will get on it and it'll ruin the cigarette. I'm down to like two cigarettes anyway. And I remember looking up at the sky, water's like hitting my face, rolling down my, you know, rolling down my face. And I'm just like, why? Why? why i'm cold i'm hungry the heroin that i paid for bullshit i was not high anymore you know or i'm cold i'm hungry i'm not high and i was like i think i was crying you know "Uh, why it was like some like shawshank redemption i'm just like sticking my arms up to the sky it rains just hitting me (sighs) My lighter doesn't work. Cigarettes are fucking wet. I'm just like, Jesus Christ. So I walk up to the, um, you know, to this like lifeguard station and I go, there's like a little spot of shelter where like, at least you can light a cigarette. It's not what you think where it's like a structure where you could go under. It's not that kind of thing. And then they lock it with the board. So you can't get up into there. And I go to light a cigarette, you know, um, because I can't get it to light because of the rain, but I get this little, area to cover it i'm trying and trying it's not fucking working and i'm just like no i'm looking for matches i don't have any check and then i find the scratcher ticket that i forgot i had and i'm like huh let's see if i want a free ticket start scratching it and it's like one of those ones where like if you get three sevens or something it's like something like that you get like three sevens and you win something get one get another one and i get another one i won and i was like eh, i get a free ticket so i scratched a little prize 500 bucks the most they can give you at a liquor store um you know without having to send away for it to the actual lottery place i was like i was like oh hallelujah it's a miracle there's no other fucking explanation for this 
and I go soaking wet with my duffel bag. I got my scruff and I go to the same gas station where the cop had told me where I couldn't be loitering. I go in there and I just give him this like wet lotto scratcher. I'm like, I won, like shaking the rabbit dope fiend foaming at the night. I won. But I was like, oh yeah, you did. All right, here you go. Gave me $500. Like he was fucking, like I was bumming a cigarette or something. I was just like, I was like, I was shocked. So I end up getting a hotel, you know, for once I could actually pay for a moment. And I found the spot that was like 30 bucks a night. Um, and we will get into what happens at the motel and what happens with the rest of my run. And then Mike Virgin's coming, and that's when Megan will come on. And I'll give you the video that I've been promising. I'm going to time it correctly so that it's right during that part of the story. And I'll go into details that I've never shared before. Thank you, guys. Talk to you soon. Stay safe. Palabra.